Um, you know, ally, it's a word that we've been hearing a lot more come up in our conversations, social media posts, blogs, and, you know, and, and, and we need allies if we want to build empathy for people's challenges and issues. And we also need allies if we want to be able to, um, oh, excuse me. And we also need to have allies if we want to build a culture that values and welcomes all people. And now more than ever, we need to be allies if we want to build a future that's based on respect, justice, and love for everyone. But now I'd like to introduce you to another, another type of ally, one that's spelled a little bit differently, one that's spelled A, the number 11, Y. And it stands for, the A stands for the, the first letter of accessibility, and the number 11 represents the 11 characters between the letters A and Y in the word accessibility. So that's A11Y. And it's this lack of accessibility why throughout my career, why I felt like I just didn't belong in my career and in my education. And in many cases, I was completely shut out. But, you know, if I truly mean we're seeing a lot more about people and organizations focusing on diversity, equity, and inclusion, but it's caused me to rethink what that meant to me. And as a result, I came up with a new acronym, one that's spelled I for inclusion, D for diversity, and E for equity. And A stands for accessibility, or providing access to all people, no matter their abilities or experiences. You see, I wasn't always blind. When my parents and my parents moved to the U.S., they immigrated to the U.S. from Kerala in southwest India in the late 60s, so my dad could go to college. Afterwards, he joined an organization in Canada, uh, which was called Northern Telecom or Nortel. It was a telecom company. And then he was transferred to North Carolina in, the, uh, in 1980. And that's where my story really begins. So I was born in this, this town called Cary, North Carolina. It has a, a uh, reputation of being called the Central Area of Relocated Yankees in North Carolina. It's in the southeast uh, part of the country, and a lot of people are not from here. But when I was growing up there, I, you know, I was one of only, one of very few brown people, people of color in my, in my school. And then when I was nine years old, my dad was transferred again. But this time he was transferred to Tokyo, Japan. And when I was in Tokyo, Japan, this is when I first started noticing changes in my eyesight. When I was playing the trumpet, I couldn't read sheet music and I struggled with it. Then during the summer times, we'd come back home to the US. And I remember one summer just laying in, the, in, in my cousin's uh, yard and we were looking up at the dark sky and we, could, we were all marveling at the beautiful stars. That next summer I came back home, uh, came back to North Carolina from Japan and we were laying in that same yard looking up at the same sky and looking up at the dark sky. And this time I couldn't see the, the stars like my cousin. And that's when I knew something's off in my eyes, but I didn't understand what it was. Then we moved back to North Carolina after three years in Tokyo. And I was going to school in, in, in middle school and high school in Raleigh. And during my high school experience, that's when I really started to uh, build up some really great relationships with my friends. And my friends, you know, they knew something was off in my eyes, but we never talked about it. We just kind of like kept sec secret. And so when I had trouble driving, they would drive me around. But when I graduated and moved to, uh, to, to Richmond, Virginia for college, I was now bumping into way too many things as I was walking around. And I felt like something is seriously wrong here. I never thought I'd be in Richmond, Virginia because you know, growing up in North Carolina, my hope was that I'd go to college with my friends who were around, uh, around in North Carolina, whether at UNC Chapel Hill or North Carolina State University. But my grades in high school didn't reflect my actual academic, my, my aptitude, because often the case I wasn't able to see, whether on the chalkboard, I couldn't see what they were saying or couldn't read. I was struggling, but I just thought that's what everyone saw. So when I was in Richmond, Virginia, I didn't, when I had trouble seeing, I didn't know who to turn to because I didn't, I wasn't really properly explaining to people what my issues were. So during the summer, winter break of my, my freshman year, I went and saw a specialist and I was diagnosed with a degenerating eye condition called retinitis pigmentosa. And I was told I was going blind and that there was no hope for a cure. The first questions that went through my mind were, what girl wants to be with the guy who can't see? What kind of 
job could I have if I was blind? And where could I live if I couldn't drive? These questions constantly consumed me, and my actions led to me finding out of college. I then ended up moving back home to North Carolina without little hope. But I was ashamed and embarrassed to tell my friends that I had failed out of college and that I had, uh, uh, was going blind. So to keep up with impressions, I enrolled in classes through a continuing education program at North Carolina State University. And in this program, I was able to take a few credits every semester. And eventually I took so many classes that they had to let me into a full-time program. And I graduated. But graduation didn't come easy. During my classes, I'd often be found staring at the clock because I knew I had to get home before sunset. Because otherwise, I became this reverse vampire. You'd rarely ever find me out on the streets during the daytime, now in the nighttime, because I couldn't see. And it wasn't safe for me or others on the road for me to be driving. But there was no other option in North Carolina. And that was my biggest hesitation about staying in my hometown of North Carolina, is that I couldn't drive. But a few, and if I, in, in my mind, if I couldn't drive, I couldn't have a career. But a few months earlier, I had visited uh, Bangalore, India, and I knew if I moved out to Bangalore, I could probably get a car and drive it pretty easily. So I did. But when I got to India, it was really challenging for me. You know, one, I, I, although I had a car and driver, the challenges of working were, were too much for me. Sometimes when I needed accommodations, asking for to be able to have a laptop versus a desktop, it, it was a big hassle to explain to people why I needed it. So after two years in India, I decided to come back home to the U.S. and I moved to New York City. And the allure of the city was just too much for me. It had amazing uh, public transportation. It uh, you know, it had a fleet of yellow taxis on my beck and call. And not to mention, if I bumped into someone on the street, there was nothing more in New York than just putting my head down and keep walking. But it was around the same time in my life where I also started noticing challenges reading text on websites. And at the time, I had no idea that this was an accessibility issue. But I found this little Microsoft magnifying mouse, which allowed me to zoom in on text and and, um, and images on the computer screen. And uh, you know, like my car and driver in Bangalore, this ma little Microsoft magnifying mouse became a tool which would enable me to continue my career. At the time, I was working for the city of New York, providing financial education for city employees during the recession. But I was living paycheck to paycheck in New York. But when I started looking at my friends around me, they were either moving up in their companies, um, or, uh, or going to grad school. And I just didn't see that same type of career trajectory for myself. That's when I reconnected with a gentleman named Steve Clemens. He and I worked with each other in Bangalore, and now he was on the board of directors of a cell phone tower manufacturing company. In, and he wanted to start up a new business in Cameroon, which is in West Central Africa. At the time, I, I, I said, hey, Steve, send me out there. I, just give me a chance. I need this because I wanted to go to grad school, but I didn't think grad school would be interested with the guy who just barely graduated from college and, and, uh, and who was going blind. So I thought this was my opportunity for me to move out to Africa to show on my resume that I had something special. Steve knew I had some eye condition and he agreed to send me. Say, I'll take a chance on you. And so I went out to go sign my contract in Hyderabad, India. And signed my contract and afterwards, that's when the executives of the company found out that I couldn't see. And the executive said, hey, we can't send you out there. You can't do this. And I pleaded with them. I said, please, give me a chance. I can do this. And they said, okay, okay. We'll give you six months and we'll go our separate way. And I said, fine. So I packed up my bags and I left Manhattan for Douala, Cameroon. And I took a $20,000 investment and I was tasked with starting a new business. At the time, I had never seen even a, a cell phone tower. And, uh, and, I, and I knew I had to figure out what I had to build a team around me because I couldn't do this alone. And eventually, my team and I, we had immediate success. I built a team of local Cameroonians, and there was around 30 of us at the time. And we had immediate success. That $20,000 investment turned into $12 million in revenue, $2.4 million in profit in just the first, team, the first 14 months of operation. And over the next three years, 
my team would have, we'd have operations across the continent and we would have sales in 22 countries. And not to mention the fact that we were build, bringing internet to millions of people across the continent. Now with this success, I thought I could go to grad school, but there was two other major accomplishments that I had no idea that I was about to accomplish. One was when I moved to Africa, I had two goals for myself. One, I wanted to be a top 30 executive under 30 in Africa. There were no such records or any awards, but I felt like I had accomplished that with the business I had started. The second piece was to climb Mount Kilimanjaro, the highest peak in Africa. And so when I signed up to do that, my sight was diminishing to the point where I, could, I needed to hold on to people and I couldn't see. And my best friend from high school, he and I went up there. And the first day of the, of the, of the trek, it was a seven day trek. The first day I had told the, uh, the guides that I couldn't see. And he said, oh no, you'll be fine, you'll be fine. Said, All right. So we went up on the first day. After that first day, we were at the base camp and he said, hey, you can't do this. You're a human, your friend is a lion. I said, okay. And, I, and that gave me the strength to say, I can keep going for this. And each day, that guide, his impression of me changed. It was through constant communication that we were able to do this. And each day we got closer and closer to the top. And on the last day of the trek, on the last day of the trek, we had to go up at the middle of the night. At this point in my life, my night vision was almost completely gone. But my friend remembered how I used to drive at night in, in North Carolina. I used to follow the tail lights of cars in the evening. And so I knew which way to go. So my friend took off the headlamp off my head and he put the lamp on the guide's foot and turned it to a red light. And so just like how I used to follow tail lights in cars, I started following the guide's foot up the mountain with my friend standing behind me, communicating with me, telling me where to put my hand. And we got there and we got to the top. But right before we got to the top, my friend, the person who had been motivating and coaching me all the way up, he got sick and didn't think he was going to make it. And that's when the role switched. And I had to help him and, and, and motivate him to reach the top. And we did it together. The other accomplishment that I wasn't expecting when I moved to Africa was the fact that I was able to read a book for the very first time in nearly five years. That's when I got my first iPad. And the accessibility features that were built into the iPad enabled me to read an ebook. I was able to put white text on a black background, which made it easier on my eyes. I was able to zoom in with just a pinch of my fingers. Now, equipped with having run a successful business and also being able to read a book, I thought I could go to grad school with my friends in, in New York. And so when I started looking at grad schools in the U.S., I thought there was only two cities I could possibly live in. That was New York or Washington, D.C. So I started reaching out to all these different uh, MBA programs in these cities. In most cases, I just received the same uh, generic email that said, thank you so much for your interest. If you want to learn more about our program, go to our website. And so when I started looking at that, I was like, oh, that's, that's fine. But one university sent me a letter, and that was George Washington University. The associate dean of the business school reached out to me. Her focus was on African diaspora investment. And she saw that I was living in, in uh, Uganda at the time. And she said, hey, I would love to talk to you. And, and she made me feel special. This is the first time that a professor wanted to talk to me rather than getting me, me getting in trouble. And so she asked me to come out and visit the campus. So I did. And I came out to Washington, D.C. And I loved it. There was public transportation all around. There was a diverse group of people from all over the world. And I felt like I belonged there. But since I was in Washington, D.C., I thought I'd go visit another university, Georgetown, which was just a mile away. And so I walked into the MBA office at Georgetown. And I said, hi, I just came from Africa. I'd love to learn more about your MBA program. And the person at the desk said, oh, no worries. You can go online and find out everything you want. <laughs> Needless to say, I didn't apply to Georgetown. I didn't apply to any other school. I only applied to George Washington University and end up being the best decision of my life. During my first week of orientation, I was at this uh, networking event and 
this networking event and they had a, uh, assigned seats where we were supposed to go sit. But I couldn't see where I was supposed to go. I turned to the person next to me. And it happened to be Liesl Riddle, that same associate dean of the business school who had tried to recruit me to the business school. She had no idea that I couldn't see. But she could empathize with what I was going through because she actually had a child with special needs. And she encouraged me to be open about my vision loss for my classmates. It was the first time in my life that anyone had told me to embrace my disability. And I gained a new level of confidence that I had never felt before. And I also gained a new sense of loyalty to the university as a result. Once I was able to be my authentic self, I was also able to open up my heart for the very first time. And I met my wife in the MBA program. But as my MBA program was coming to an end, most of my classmates were all focused on preparing for interviews while I was still stuck on the very first step, the online applications. In many cases, the online applications just weren't accessible to me. The, I'd often get timed out as I was trying to complete them because it took me too long. And I'd have to start all over from the very beginning each time. And often the, 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 the labels on the forms, they just weren't high contrast enough. So I couldn't see what I needed to complete. Needless to say, this was frustrating. How could somebody with my education and my experience struggle with completing such a simple task? It brought me to tears more than once, but I eventually landed on my feet with an emerging market crowdfunding platform. That company was focused on raising capital from diaspora to invest back into their home country. And it was a great fit for me at the time. The team was based in London, I was in DC, so I didn't have to travel to work, worry about travel. And I was also working in a market that I felt comfortable with. I had spent years in Africa and India, and now I was able to help raise capital for businesses in these countries. In these, and so it was great. And it was really, it was really interesting also to see how entrepreneurs were take, building new stuff, software companies in, in this continent where I helped build the internet infrastructure. In Nigeria, I helped raise capital for a company who wanted to be the first Uber for am, like am, uh, ambulances, a company called Ignite. In Nigeria, we were looking to raise capital for a company called Hello Tractor, who is the Uber of, of tractors. And so these were some of the cool things I got to see. But in 2017, the company folded. We were funded by USAID and there was a shift in appetite for emerging markets. And I found myself without a job. My wife and I had just built a house in the Washington DC area. And we had just welcomed our first child at this time, both of which are not cheap. And the stress of it all caused my site to go even faster. And even with the magnification software and the, and the, uh, and the um, inverted color screens, I just couldn't see the computer screen anymore. And I thought my career was over. That's when I heard about this software that was developed at a company called SAS a data science company. And it was designed to help people who are blind and low vision visualize graphs and charts using cell. And I thought it was so cool. But what was really cool was the guy who designed it. His name was Ed Summers, and he lived in my hometown of Cary, North Carolina, the very same place I never thought anyone who was blind could ever live. And I tried for months to get in touch with him without any luck. Finally, my wife said, if he can live in North Carolina, maybe we can too. And so we found a house online and we told my parents and we got so excited. My parents never thought I was coming home. And my dad immediately jumped in the car to go look at this house. And as he was driving, he's talking to us and he started yelling at something. He said, what are you doing, dad? He said, oh, there's a blind guy on the road. Maybe it's a guy you're trying to get in touch with. Oh, dad, please don't yell blind people on the road. Don't yell at anyone on the road. And so he got out of the car and walked over to this poor guy. And he says, are you Ed Summers? And the guy says, yes, I am. And my dad puts the phone in his ear and says, my son's trying to reach you. And after apologizing profusely to Ed, he agreed to meet me. And I came down that next weekend. A 30 minute conversation turned to three hours. And Ed became a friend and a mentor. Ed showed me 
that accessibility would enable me to continue my career and that my dreams of being an executive weren't dead. He also encouraged me to embrace my disability, just like Liesl had told me in grad school. So I started reaching out to all these organizations that had a diversity, equity, and inclusion program. But not a single company responded to me. And I felt like I didn't check off a box that they wanted to fill. And coming from Washington, D.C., you're so defined by your job. The first thing people ask, well, what do you do? What do you do? And I started thinking about it. If I couldn't find a job with my education, my experience, my privilege, what about other blind people? And that's when I had heard about this, this podcast where they had interviewing the founder of a shoe company called Tom Shoes. And the shoe company would give a pair of shoes to somebody in need whenever you bought a pair of shoes. I liked the concept, but what I wanted to do was I wanted to make sunglasses but instead of giving a pair of sunglasses to someone in need, I wanted to have them made by people who are blind. And so I told Ed about this because I thought if I can give someone a job, I could give them hope, I could give them my life and this generational impact. And that's when Ed said, I got to introduce you to someone. And he introduced me to a gentleman named Jeffrey Hodden, who was, a, who was the president of a company called LCI. And it was the largest employer of Americans who are blind. And they were located just seven miles from where I grew up. This company was a manufacturing company that employed people who were blind, and they made 2,500 products. So when I met with Jeffrey, I was like, oh, this is great. I can learn, you know, he may be able to help me make my sunglasses. But Jeffrey kept on talking about wanting to create technology-based jobs. And so we agreed to you know, stay in touch. And on August 4th, 2017, my wife and I decided to leave Washington, DC, even without selling our house, they said, we just got to get out of here. And it was the day I decided to take Ed's advice and to learn to learn as a blind person. That was using a screen reader to be able to use my computer now, no longer relying on my weakest asset of my eyes. And that's the same day that Jeffrey Hodden emailed me and said he wanted to start a new business for technology services and asked if I was interested in joining so I came back home and I joined that company. And I was tasked with creating upward mobility for people who are blind. But I knew from my own lived experiences, the first thing we had to do was address the accessibility issue. So I started doing that. There was a young lady named Von Vu. She was applying for a job on another team. I happened to be walking by um, the interview uh, in the office. And the person in the asked me to come in and I started talking to her. Von Vu had graduated from college five years earlier. She was totally blind, but for five years, she had been doing only unpaid internships and didn't have a full-time job. Here was somebody who was totally blind, graduated college in four years. And in my mind, that's a problem solving. She knew how to adapt and to be successful. And so I hired her immediately. And I built a team around her. And so with Von Vu, and then the next second employee was a lady named Carla Smith. She had worked for the state of North Carolina for 40 years, but her love for shopping, what she couldn't, she won't when she retired, she didn't want to stop working. So she joined our team. And so now we learned, the three of us learned how to, to make content more accessible. We spent the entire year of 2018 focused on learning how do we make digital content accessible? And by 2019, we started to generate revenue. That's when we reached out and started to see that the arts community really embraced inclusion and that they gave us a chance on doing accessibility. And then in the same time, I started getting involved in the diversity, equity, and inclusion community in North Carolina. When I was looking for jobs earlier, those same individuals weren't thinking about people with disabilities. Now I knew if I could get a seat at the table, I could help change that. Because in my mind, proximity builds empathy. And the more that they could spend time with me, they could see that disabilities were part of diversity, equity, and inclusion. What I noticed was when I got on the, on the, the seat at the table was that I was the only person thinking about it from a business perspective. 
most of the individuals who were thinking about this concept were compliance individuals, HR individuals or lawyers. But I thought about it from a business perspective because I thought you can be more inclusive. You're going to be able to reach out to more people. That's when I was at a tech conference and I heard this person speaking. His name is Donald Thompson. And he was the CEO of a company called Rockwest. And he was talking about the importance of diversity, equity, and inclusion in technology. And at the end of his conversation, he said, I'll meet anyone for coffee, just reach out. So I did. And I met Donald for coffee. And when we met, he also said he never thought about people with disabilities in the context of diversity and inclusion or in tech. It was soon after that, that Donald would then have people from his team come and meet me. And one of those people was Mike Ionelli, who is now my co-founder of Abra. 18 months after seeing Donald Thompson speak, Mike and I launched Abra, an organization that's focused on removing the uh, barriers that have been hindering people with disabilities from all aspects of life, including employment and education. And when we started this business, we realized there's three pillars we had to address. One was eliminating the digital divide, and we're doing that through our digital accessibility services. The second piece was changing the mindset of people and organizations, and we're doing that through our disability inclusion training and advisory services. And the third piece was creating pathways for employment, which we're doing through our workforce development programs, tra training people on how to do jobs. These three things are allowing us to break down those barriers and get more people with disabilities into the workforce. We're giving them hope. But it all comes back to accessibility in my mind. That cornerstone of all of this is it's critical. We cannot do this unless we address that accessibility issues. So when we think about the workforce development programs we're building, we're thinking about accessibility. When we're thinking about the disability inclusion, we're talking about accessibility. So as I wrap up my conversation here today, I'm not asking you to travel 30,000 miles around the world like I did. And I'm not asking you to start up a disability inclusion company. But what I am doing is challenging you to add accessibility to your inclusion, diversity, equity programs. And build a sense of belonging for all people. Because this idea is an idea that all organizations can implement. So thank you so much for your time today. And I'm so excited to see the bridges that you'll be building.